morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint. I'm Darshan Mehta. Joining me on the show is Agam Bakil. Agam will speak about the FNOQs. I'll speak about the general trade setup. And the trade setup looks uh, encouraging at this point of time because the global markets are doing extremely well. The SX Nifty has managed to recover from the lows of the day. At the start of the day, it was down almost 10 points. It's managed to recover. <coughs> it's up almost 28 points. So at, at the start, it seems to be pretty decent. Now, as far as the ADRs is concerned, uh, some of the ADRs were down in trade. Dr. Eddie's Infosys, Tata Motors and Vedanta, uh, they were down in trade. But again, there seems to be traction among the banks. So HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank were trading much sharper in trade. Commodities has managed to recover significantly over the past two days. Uh, oil has managed to recover uh, back into the green. So again, uh, you're seeing WTI crude and Brent crude, both of them moving in, in trade for the past two days. Again, as far as metals are concerned, extremely strong close by the base metals on the LME. So if you're looking at aluminium, it was up half a percent. Copper was up almost one percent. Zinc was up one and a half, one point three percent. Nickel was up close to two percent. Lead and tin, both of them were up. Even Comics Copper is trading with a positive bias. So the trend among commodities on the LME was positive. Again, if you're looking at China, decent start apart from aluminium, which uh, somehow is trading down one and a half over one percent. The other base metals seem to be doing well. Gold and silver are, are taking a knock today, given the fact that commodities and equities are rallying. So there seems to be a little bit of uh, traction on the wrong side for the commodities. Flows, FIS has turned marginal sellers yesterday. They sold in 136 crores. DIS, aggressive buyer, and with this 1,294 crore buying that DIS did, uh, DIS again for the month have come back into the green. Overall, if you're looking at it, 13,245 crores and another 400 crores, so close to almost uh, uh, 17,000, uh, 17, uh, I'm sorry, 13,700 uh, crores of net buying has happened, so close to $2 billion of net buying has happened by, uh, by the FIS and DIS this month. Nifty Bank managed to recover significantly from the lows of the day led by, you know, HDFC Bank. <coughs> but Nifty continued to wane because of certain IT performances. Small cap and mid cap, despite the Nifty moving, uh, uh, the mid caps and small caps have been taking a hammering over the past few days, so they are rather weak in trade. Uh, Pharma, again, was one of the biggest losers in trade yesterday, and real estate man was managing to hold on. Some of the real estate counters did manage to do well. Now, the Nifty was down 20 points. What contributed? The HDFC Twins, Reliance and Kota contributed. What didn't? It was Tata Steel because of the uh, adjustment of the rights. Uh, there was Infosys and ITC which were down in trade. But Agam, budget day important. Uh, where are positions being taken? Right now, Darshan, we are seeing a lot of accumulation in the 11,400, 500 calls. But I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, for now, we've seen unwinding in the Nifty futures and we've seen unwinding in the Nifty bank futures as well. Uh, you know, can, coming to the India volatility index, that's where we've seen a further decline of around nearly 3%. Again, India wicks now below the mark of 16. Uh, what we've also seen is the put call ratios come off to a certain extent around 1.29. Moving in, in terms of changes in open interest, as I was mentioning earlier, it's the 11,300, 400 and 500 calls which have seen substantial amount of writing. Uh, moving in, uh, we're also talking about, uh, about a few stocks which have moved into the FNO band, so Fortis Healthcare and Gen Irrigation move in. Uh, we're looking at for a lot of fresh shots in escorts, so which, uh, which where the stock declined by as much as nearly 2.5%. And similarly, a lot of shots building up in Arvind as well where the stock moved up by down by as much as 2.7%. That said, all eyes will be on the Nifty and whether or not we hold even as we move in towards the union budget presentation. Well, amongst the stocks that we're tracking in news today is uh, IIFL Holdings, where the company has announced a Group D merger. What that means is it will uh, separately list three different companies for each of their businesses, that is uh, the NBFC business, uh, the capital markets business, and the wealth business. But uh, they've said that this uh, will take, uh, 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 they will need approvals, and it will take about 10 to 12 months for uh, this process to be completed. That apart, we're also watching out for Unipa Industries. Now, the company will acquire 100% stake in Art Matrix technology. Additionally, uh, they have also said that uh, they will raise a total of uh, 600 crores via issue of uh, uh, preferential uh, equity shares to the promoters and also convertible warrants. That apart, we're also watching out for Quest Corp, where a couple of acquisitions are lined up for the company. They will acquire Monster.com for $14 million and they've also said that they will acquire HCL Computing products for 30 crores. Then, 
next talk that we're tracking in trade today is uh, TV 18 broadcast where they've raised uh, their stake in Viacom 18 to 51 uh, percent for a cash consideration of 20 million dollars. We're also tracking Amtec group of companies. Now Amtec Auto said that NCLT has granted an extension of 90 days for insolvency proceedings. Uh, Darpa Jindal stainless will be in focus as well. They're going to raise about 1200 crores by issue of securities. Uh, you also have Nebel's Ventures which will raise 2000 crores via rights issue and the price for the rights issue has been fixed at 240 per share. That apart, uh, and lastly, we're also tracking Suntech Realty, which has announced its foray into affordable housing. Uh, quite the app timing, but uh, those are the stocks you need to track in trade today. I am not in the camp uh, which uh, says that uh, we should deliberately uh, raise expenditures and finance it through fiscal deficit. And the reason is that the economy is already bottomed out. I mean, that is one of the reasons. One is that the economy is already bottomed out and is on the way up. Uh, the time to uh, think about these things is when uh, it's on the way down or it's stuck at the bottom. So that is the first point. The second point is there is a hard-earned uh, 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 reputation, which takes a lot of time to earn, of uh, sticking to fiscal uh, targets and I think uh, uh, one should not violate that lightly and the third point is if they are temporary shortfalls uh, in uh, uh, because of GST and so on uh, I think there is still sufficient time as I've been saying for the last three to six months uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the the equity sale the the government public sector sales uh, to make up for that shortfall so for all three of these reasons uh, I am against uh, uh, violating the, the, the targets. Uh, fiscal policy should be counter-cyclical. In the present situation, we have already bottomed out, as he said, uh, because you look at the quarterly growth figures, uh, uh, growth has started uh, rising again. And uh, you're looking at something like, you know, probably the next fiscal looking at 7% plus growth rate real. Plus, uh, while it's a negative thing, the beginning of increase in oil prices, which might translate to higher inflation, from a f uh, fiscal space point of view, it actually helps because, uh, you know, if your inflation rate goes up, your nominal GDP will grow up on top of that 7%. So I think we are looking at something like 12 to 14% nominal GDP growth rate next year, which gives you some extra elbow room. Furthermore, while GST has indeed uh, been uh, you know, declining in the past few months uh, as part of the initial uh, uh, you know, teething troubles, they are first of all trying to try tighten down on that. So I expect some improvement. Furthermore, everything else is up. You know, the direct tax revenue has been very buoyant. You find that the target for disinvestment is overshooting targets and so on and also the surpluses that are going to be mobilized from the central public sector undertakings as well as the RBI already you have seen that they have reduced the borrowing program from 50,000 uh, announced just uh, last month to 30,000 very drastic reduction showing that the government is confident of these non-tax revenues uh, coming in and that will also be a uh, strong strength for next year. The risk of contracting, we don't do services, we do products. Okay. We make products in India for the world at large. Okay. So in that sense, we are like any other company quite literally. We're not a services company, it's not a staffing or an IT services kind of an operation. Correct. Uh, so are we affected? Absolutely yes. So we spend in rupee, we earn in dollars. When you earn in dollars and for every dollar you get less rupee, and on the one side you have wage bills going up, the margin narrows. Mm, that's true. Uh, Mr. Khan, you are into manufacturing. Now, how, how is the picture there? Because what we have been told, you know, the last 12, 13 months of uh, disruptions that we have seen yeah. is, is good for the longer term. But we have been told that the manufacturing segment has been worst hit, especially if you are in the mid to small segment. The manufacturing segment is it mainly because of capital is the major concern. The frequency at which the payment is to be made for GST every month hmm. and the incoming payment is after three months. Mm -hmm. So its only thing is, is a small short term problem where some additional finance is required. 
if the SME gets additional finance, additional capital at a lower rate of interest than the bigger players or the big brothers, then it won't be a much problem for SME to grow. So the maximum uh, the job employment happens by SME in India today. So we, we do hear uh, of several schemes. We have a small industries development bank actually but and there's a mudra which has now started funding entrepreneurs it is for two uh, lesser it's not going to everybody uh, in the sme very few companies mm. knows about these incentives availability of finance secondly there is an see the, there's a difference between listed sme and unlisted smes mm. now unlisted smes the trust level is less by all the uh, capital uh, or banks or nfbc or uh, other finance companies to give so there, uh, some training part or some regulation is required, uh, some effort is required on the government front to ensure that the non-listed entities also get uh, finance uh, easily. If there are three reforms from our industry ke point of view, one is to create a zone, it will go down the production cost, it will be a labor reform, it will be quality improved and production will be fast. And third, it will be funded by the requirement. Okay. So, if these three things are happening, then India is a country of cotton produce and there is a lot of things that can be done. We all started a business at a, any particular point of time based on certain government uh, assurances that okay. there are waivers in hmm. VAT, service tax, local taxes, maybe uh, electricity incentives and all that. But what has happened is after GST coming in, like in the hospitality space also, we were given certain breaks to become viable. So otherwise, it was not viable in those certain zones to put up these projects. But because we've taken the risk, because the government assured us of the benefits of the taxes, we have done it. Now, what has happened after GST coming in, those have gone away, whether it is luxury tax waiver, entertainment tax waiver, there are a case like example, a cinema company recently went to court uh, to uh, fight for that and there are various other people also who are willing to go, entertainment industries, amusement park industries, hospitality industry players. Now rather than all of us address this issue in court, it would be most appropriate for the finance department to address this and give us what they've already promised so that it is over, it's over. We know in future it's not there. So as a prudent businessman, I will plan and do it if I afford it but if the government has said that look you can't afford it here's how I make you viable mm. then it's their duty to give it to us so this is also something which I think the you know finance department needs to address yeah. for all the uh, industry stakeholders what I expect we'll see is you know various schemes and things that are specifically packaged or specifically targeted at different groups so there'll be something for farmers for sure uh, there'll be something for the middle class, the salaried earners. There may be something for the self-employed. And I think what they're going to try and do is basically slice and dice it in a way that they can show and they can signal that they are actually uh, looking out for various groups. And that is then going to kind of uh, meld into their 2019 campaign. I think the government is is very much constrained in what they can do. I think we tend to think of these pre-election year budgets as you know populist budgets or pro-poor budgets, but uh, given the fiscal realities this government faces, I think they're going to be hard pressed really to amp up spending in the way that they would have liked. So I think the signs that we're seeing is yes, we might see a relative pause on the fiscal deficit consolidation roadmap. You might see some increases in rural spending. I think uh, the results from the Gujarat election certainly have rattled this government, particularly the ways in which the BJP uh, underperformed in rural relative to urban areas to the Congress party. But I think this government is also very concerned about the inflation numbers and that if they are to engage uh, in more populist measures, that could be counterproductive. And I think that's really the message that uh, came out uh, of last day of interviews from the chief economic advisor of Subramaniam saying if you go down a populist path, uh, this could actually be politically quite uh, counterproductive, not to mention economically so as well. The Central Statistics Office in its first revised estimate has kept the GDP growth for financial year 16-17 unchanged at 7.1% and has revised uh, GDP growth for financial year 15-16 upwards to 8.2% uh, from 8% estimated earlier. In terms of uh, real gross value added, the CSO said that uh, the GVA growth for financial year 16-17 has been revised to 7.1%, which compares with the earlier estimate of 6.6%. For FY 14-15, the CSO has revised GDP growth 
GDP growth to 7.4% against the earlier estimate of 7.5% put out by CSO. But it was a strong quarter from Larson and Tubro uh, in, in results that came out after market hours yesterday. The top line growth was uh, at 10% uh, coming in in line with what we were anticipating. But uh, it's the operational performance that was extremely strong. 10.9% is the EBITDA margin versus our expectation of 10.1% and a 25% growth on the EBITDA front. Order inflow has been rather strong. They got in orders of almost 48,000 crores when our anticipation was close to 40,000 crore. And the management has said that you know some of the orders which were bulled up over the past few, past few months because of GST issues, they got transferred into the third quarter. So that is uh, something that they say. But the domestic execution pickup will be taken as a positive. It was basically the orders in the infrastructure and the hydrocarbon segment that got them the orders. Now, as far as guidance is concerned, they main maintain their guidance both on, on all three fronts, on the top line, bottom line, as well as margins. So they expect, despite a strong order flow, they expect a flat order flow for the for the year, uh, for the year FY, FY18. So as far as order flow is concerned, uh, it was infrastructure, hydrocarbons, the product development services, uh, heavy engineering, all of them came out with strong set of revenues and they have actually uh, aided the revenues this time around. Most of the, all the brokerages in fact have uh, given the results a thumbs up. The only concern that they have pointed out is uh, the elevated working capital cycle that LNT has been. It was mainly on account of GST related issues but nevertheless uh, a strong set of numbers from LNT. Let's also listen in to what the management had to say. Uh, Post the numbers. Share of international orders have uh, shrunk from one third of the order inflow in the previous year to about 16% for the quarter and about 26% for the uh, nine month period. We do believe that this ratio of three fourths domestic, one fourth international could be the situation as we get towards the end of this year. ICICI Bank was another company which reported uh, numbers after market hours. The bank missed estimates with a profit uh, degrowth of 32 percent uh, to 1650 crores. But core earnings growth and loan book growth were the key highlights of the quarter. The domestic uh, retail book grew at a five quarter high of 16 percent. On the asset quality front, also the path to normalization continued with the gross NPA coming at 7.82 percent versus 7.87 percent. Additionally, the RBI audit also does not really throw up any major negative surprises. Uh, brokerages have uh, uh, viewed this results positively with Credit Suez uh, retaining their outperform but hiking the target price to 405 from 347. They have said that the while uh, provisions could remain higher in the fourth quarter, they expect gains from stake sale in ICICI securities to cushion profitability and the fact that ICICI Bank remains the best capitalized corporate lender. Morgan Stanley has retained their overweight and the target price at 408 uh, they expect the bank to show continued progress on asset quality over the next five to six quarters and it remains their top pick. But listen in to what the management had to say with respect to the asset quality. Additions to NPA this year should be substantially lower than the additions in the previous year. And I think the trend that is emerging uh, still makes us believe that the additions would be lower. I think the provision level will remain a little elevated for a few quarters because, you know, of the NCLT provisions. Also, as the NCLT cases get decided, then you will know the final provisions to be made in some of the existing cases. Uh, plus, some of the aging provisions uh, come for the existing NPA cases. Okay, in the midst of budget, there will be certain earnings that will be reported today. One of the important companies is the Bajaj Finance and Shraddha. Uh, Bajaj Finance numbers today, what are the key numbers that we can expect and what are the factors? Uh, so, Darshan, uh, Bajaj Finance is expected to continue with a strong growth trajectory and uh, we are expecting a solid 33% earnings growth. If that happens, this will be the 11th quarter, 11th straight quarter of 30% plus sort of a profit growth. So, net profit is seen at 742 crores. With respect to margins, you could see uh, them coming in higher on account of the recent capital infusion. Uh, with respect to the AUM growth that's expected to come in at a strong 38 uh, to 40% kind of a number, mainly uh, led by the festive season and the consumer growth uh, book. Having said that, the rural business also should uh, register a strong growth, although on a lower base, while business loans are likely to remain weak. Asset quality, again, expected to remain stable. The gross NPA number in the second quarter was at 1.68%. Uh, so broadly, watch out for commentary with respect to 
to the business growth momentum and asset quality trends, especially in the LAP and 2-3 uh, wheeler portfolios. But broadly, Capital First posted a good set of numbers, so that should be the case with Bajaj Finance as well. Okay, so Bajaj Finance is one of the key numbers that we are watching out for, and another nifty company, and that is Power Grid, will come out with numbers. Uh, Jayesh, what are the expectations? Morning, Udashan. So, you know, as steady as it gets, it's Power Grid. Uh, the three numbers, actually, that you need to watch out for, 13, 14, and 15. 13% EBITDA growth, 14% revenue growth and 15% uh, top uh, you know net profit growth however margins are likely to contract from about 91.7% uh, to what we are expecting is 89.4% in terms of the factors that we are watching out for uh, so transmission business has become important for power grid uh, so what's the revenue growth over there that is likely to come in at about 15% on a year on year basis the capitalization to capex ratio is likely to be above 1x uh, with the capitalization range being from anywhere between 5,500 crores to 7,000 crores. And lastly, we'll be watching out for any guidance that the management gives on capex and capitalization going ahead. Okay, so that's the view that will come in on uh, Power Grid when they report their earnings today. With that, uh, we are run out of the show. But uh, before we end the show, here's a quick view of what uh, former, Ched, uh, former Fed uh, Chief Alan Greenspan had to say on bonds and equities going ahead. Dealing with a fiscally unstable long-term outlook in which inflation will take hold. In fact, uh, I was very much surprised that in the State of the Union message yesterday, uh, all those new initiatives were not funded. And I think we're getting to the point now where we're, the breakout is going to be on, on the inflation upside. The only question is when. We've been through a, almost a decade now of stagnation, and we're working our way towards stagflation, which, as you know, is a combination of both of those.